Okay. So remember, last time what we did was define field automorphisms in general. So we defined field automorphisms in general. Now we're going to start using that definition right away. What we're going to do now is say, alright, so we've got this definition. Let's fix some field L. And then let's look at all of its automorphisms. So let's take all of the automorphisms of L, and we'll put them together into one set called the automorphism set of L, or the automorphism group of L. More about that in a second. We're going to know that thing ot L. So we know what a field automorphism is. We're going to fix some field L. And then we're going to look at all the automorphisms of L, put them into one object called ot L. And as I let slip a second ago, ot L is actually going to be a group. Is a group in the algebraic sense. And this is cool. This is important. Because what it's going to allow us to do, eventually, is kind of mix field theory and group theory. Group theoretic facts about ot L will reflect upon field theoretic facts about L. And field theoretic facts about L will tell us group theoretic facts about ot L. So we've got this nice relationship between group theory and field theory. We've got L on one hand and ot L on the other. And they're going to inform each other. And the way that's going to happen, or one way in which that's going to happen, is through these guys, these inertia subgroups. What's going to happen is this, we say, all right, so we fix this guy, L, and we looked at ot L. Now what we're going to do, now that we've got this group ot L, we look at some special subgroups, these inertia subgroups. And the way that we're going to get these guys is to say, all right, let's let L over K be some field extension. Let's let, in other words, let's let K is a subfield, subfield of L. That's just saying the same thing as that L over K is a field extension. So this notation, as we'll say in a minute, just means that K is a subfield of L. Alright, so we've got ot L. Now we're going to form ot L over K. And this is going to be the subgroup of ot L consisting of all the automorphisms of L that fix K. All the automorphisms of L that restrict to the identity on K. All the automorphisms of L, which leave K inert. And once we've got this guy, once we have this notion of subfields giving rise to subgroups, we'll have one half of the important correspondence. The correspondence we'll be using again and again later on. So those kind of are our three goals for today. We want to do three things today. We want to, first of all, define, define ot L. We want to define, define ot of L over K. And then we want to kind of take a quick look at this correspondence. So look at correspondence. And I haven't really said what this is yet. Or rather, you couldn't be expected to understand what I meant unless you already had seen this. So we'll look at this correspondence. Okay. So those are our three goals for today. We're going to define ot L. We're going to define ot L over K. We'll, of course, make mention of the group theoretic facts. The fact that this guy is a group, and that this guy is a subgroup of that group. And then we're going to look at how this fits together into part of the correspondence. We won't see the whole correspondence today, but we'll see, I guess, half of it. Okay. So first, just to make explicit, or to write down what we said earlier, so we'll have a definition. Let's let L be a field. And we just want to repeat what we said earlier. Let L be a field. And we're going to let ot L it's just a fixed notation in terminology. Ot L is the set of field automorphisms, field automorphisms of L. So that's just kind of, let's write down what we said earlier about this guy, what's the definition of this guy. We've got some field L, we're going to let ot L denote the set of all its automorphisms. Just to replete the earlier claim now, the claim 
is that ought L is a group. This is important. It's a group under composition. So remember, a group is a set along with a binary operation, and our set is going to be ought L, and our binary operation is going to be functional composition. Okay, now, this is a really important fact. The fact that this is a group is kind of the foundation of a lot of stuff later, because remember, we're going to be playing with group theory and field theory, so it's important, it's really important to us that this guy is a group. This is a really important claim. We'll end up using it again and again later on. Now that being said, uh, that means I should probably prove it, but I'm not going to. But I will instead tell you what one should do in order to prove it. So let me just spell this out really quickly. We're not going to actually verify the group definition, but I just want to say a little bit about what you would do if you were going to verify this. And if you haven't verified this kind of thing at least once in your life, uh, then I think you it wouldn't hurt to do so. And yeah, so let me just say what one might do. So if we really wanted to check that IL is a group, this important fact that it's a group, we really wanted to check this and kind of see why it's true, there are a few things we'd have to verify. We'd have to verify that it's closed under composition. So in other words, if you've got two functions, sigma and tau, inside of ought of L, well that's going to imply that sigma composed with tau is an ought L as well. So that's the first thing. And we should check that sigma is associative. Maybe you know that this is just true in general, that functional composition functional composition is associated. But we have to use this fact, or if you haven't seen it, we have to check it too. Then we have to check that this has a group identity, right? Every group has an identity. So in our case, what the identity is going to be is the identity function from L to itself. Remember in the last video, we said that this guy was in fact the field automorphism of L. So that's where we use that fact in the last video. And the last thing we have to check is that inverses exist. So remember in the last video, we said that if sigma is inside of ought L, if sigma is a field automorphism of L, then the functional inverse, sigma inverse, is also a field automorphism of L. So that's where that fact comes in, that fact in the last video. So again, if we're going to be fully rigorous and check that odd L is indeed a group. These are the things you would have to verify. And I recommend that you verify them if you haven't kind of done so. Um, it's nice to see why all of this stuff is true, but I'm not going to verify it in this video. Okay. So that's sort of checking that odd L is a group, this important fact that odd L is a group. So now we've defined this guy. And we've taken care, we've taken care of this first item. Find what odd L is. So now we want to move on to defining what odd of L over K is. So let's do that. Well, let's see. So, definition. Let's let, let's let L over K be a field extension. Field extension. And all that that means is that all that that means is that K is a subfield of L. So let L over K be a field extension. Then we're going to let ought of L over K be equal to the set of all field automorphisms of L. Fix k. Sigma fixes fixes k. And what does that mean? This means that sigma of x is equal to x for all x inside of k. So this guy goes by a few names. This is sometimes called the inertia inertia subgroup. 
to verify this group fact or say something about it. Maybe we should just call it an inertia subset for now. So this is the inertia subgroup of odd L associated decay. Why? Well, everything in odd of L over K fixes K. It leaves everything in K inert. It doesn't move any of the elements. This is also sometimes called the subfield, or the subgroup of odd L. Subgroup of odd L. Fixing K. So we're looking at all of the elements, all of the fuel automorphisms of L, which leave K alone, which don't move anything in K, which we're looking at all the fuel automorphisms of L that restrict to the identity on K. That's what odd L over K is. Now, we said a second ago, this is a subgroup of odd of L over K. And as you can probably guess, I'm not going to check that either, but let me quickly tell you kind of what you might have to do in order to check that. So, if you wanted to check that odd of L over K really is a subgroup of odd L, there are three things you should check. First, the identity is in there. And then it's that it's closed under composition. So in other words, if you start out with two things, sigma and tau. So sigma and tau are inside of odd L, and they fix K. Then so does sigma composed with tau. That's what this first thing is saying. Then one would also have to check that it's closed under the taking of inverses. So that means that if sigma inside of odd L fixes, fixes K, then so does sigma inverse. That's what this third point is saying. So we really wanted to check that odd L is a subgroup, or odd of L over K is a subgroup of odd L. These are the things we have to check. And we're not going to check them in this video, but again, I encourage you to do so if you're so inclined. And even if you're not, <laughs> as long as you think it'd be good for you. Especially if you haven't done this at least once in your life. Sometimes if you've taken a course on abstract algebra, you've had to do stuff like this without really seeing why it's important, maybe. But, uh, yeah, at least at one point you should check this. Okay, so now let's look at some examples. And I like considering the most trivial examples I can cook up, so that's what we're going to do. So, let's start out by considering this extension. We're going to consider C as an extension of R, and then R as an extension of Q. So all that means is, you know, the rational numbers, they sit inside the real numbers, they sit inside the complex numbers. So we're looking at that tower of extensions. And the first group we want to look at is ought of C over R. So we're looking at all of the automorphisms of C, which fix R. Now, of course, the identity is in here. The identity fixes all of C, and it if it fixes all of C, then it also fixes R. So the identity morphism is in here. And if you remember from the first video, complex conjugation is in here too. Complex conjugation. Complex conjugation is an automorphism of C. We said that in the first video. And it fixes R. We said that in the first video too. So complex conjugation is an odd of C over R. And you may be a little surprised to learn that that's it. Those are the only two things in ought of C over R. So the only two things in ought of C over R are the identity and complex conjugation. Maybe I'll put up a video saying why that's true, because I don't think it's totally easy to see. So there are only two automorphisms of C which fix R, the identity and complex conjugation. And again, maybe I'll put up a video about that, saying why it's true. Okay, maybe we should make a remark. If this is true, well, there is only, remember, this guy is a group. Odd of C over R is a group. And there's only one group that has two elements. That's the cyclic group of order 2. So what that means is that this automorphism group 
is isomorphic to Z mod 2, the generator being complex conjugation. Okay. So how about odd of R over Q, the, rash, the reals over the rationals? Well, again, the identity is in here. And this time, that's actually the only thing. The identity is the only element inside of here. So odd of R over Q, that's just the trivial group consisting of a single element. Trivial group. There are no non-trivial automorphisms of R, which fix Q. And this is kind of hard to see, too, I think. So maybe I'll put up a video about why this is true as well. Okay. So now that we've taken those examples, maybe we can check off the second point, defining and discussing ought of L over K. So that leaves us with the third point of seeing this correspondence. This correspondence that we were mentioning between subfields of L and subgroups of ought L. What we've done today is look at half of it. And this correspondence is fundamental. This guy is really important. So let's quickly say what we've done today, and then sort of make some remarks about it. So what we've done today is say, let's let L be a field, and let's look at the set of all subfields of L. So the entire collection of subfields of L. And then over here, let's look at all the subgroups of ought L. What we've done today, we've done today, we've got incredible Hulk colors, here. So what we've done today is say, how, if you've got a subfield of L, do you get a subgroup of odd L? What you do is go to odd of L over K. You look at the inertia subgroup associated to K, the fixing group associated to K. That's what we've done today. So we've got a subfield, K, of L, and then we're going to take that subfield and map it over to a subgroup of odd L. We've got k, we turn it into odd of l over k. And that's what we talked about today. And in the future, what we're going to do is find a map going in the other direction. We'll talk about this guy later. Maybe you can guess what it is. Maybe if uh, you haven't seen this before, it'd be kind of fun to spend some time figuring out how we could go from subgroups to subfields. Of course, there are lots of ways, but maybe try to think of a way that feels inverse to this guy. Anyway, so why do we care about this correspondence? I kind of hyped it up a bit. Well, the reason why we care about this is just that kind of vague remark I was making earlier. So this is going to help us play with field theory on one hand and group theory on the other hand. So the subgroups of ought L are going to correspond somehow to subfields of L. And the subfields of L, by this association, are going to correspond to subgroups of odd L. And this is really cool. This is kind of what I think is maybe a formative fact about Galois theory, kind of something which makes the theory work, is this idea that we've got subfields over here, and we can sort of turn them into subgroups, and subgroups over here turn into subfields. So field theory on one hand, the field theory of L, is going to influence the group theory of odd L field theoretic properties of L are going to tell us things about odd L, and vice versa. Facts about odd L, group theoretic facts about odd L, tell us something about the field structure of L. So the field theory informs the group theory, and the group theory informs the field theory. We've got this nice translation going back between the two. And sort of this churning is what makes a lot of the stuff work. You take field theoretic facts, they tell you group theoretic things, to take group theoretic things to tell you field theoretic facts. So this correspondence is pretty important. And we'll be talking about what this other path of it is, and we'll be using it extensively later on.